Okay, so at this point, let's talk about phylogenetics and classification. So if we think about Linnaeus's hierarchical classification system, this binomial nomenclature and the system that he came up with, he gave the names of organisms and they're arranged as nested sets, right? So for example, there'd be a phylum called chordata, and then within that phylum, there were a bunch of other classes, one of which is mammals, within classes would be a bunch of different genuses, one of which is pan. So for example, if you were going to specify the name of the regular chimpanzees, it has a kingdom, a phylum, a class, an order, a family, a genus, and a species. Each of these is within one of those. And that was the way that uh, Linnaeus named things, and that was the way that nature seemed to be organized, according to him. I should point out that these aren't the only levels that exist in this hierarchical classification system. There are superfamilies and infraorders and things like that. So for example, here we have New World and Old World primates between the order of primates and the family of hominidae. Now this organization of living things that has these nested sets, at the time of Linnaeus, this was apparent and obvious, but there's no actual explanation for why nature has to be this way. You could imagine that maybe if you were going to create a bunch of organisms from scratch, you could take bits and pieces from here and there, and you could get organisms that didn't fall into a categorization like this. But the observation was that life did fall into a situation like this with nested sets of organisms. So evolutionary relationships explain this hierarchical classification system, which if we don't have a model like evolution, it's kind of arbitrary without some sort of descent. And this pattern of living things here is explained by a process of evolution that works like this. So you go back in time, you have a lineage of organisms moving along over time, and then there's a split. So this group goes off, this group goes off, they have their own separate evolution for a while, they have their own separate evolution for a while. But if this thing here was a chordate, right, it had evolved a notochord, then its descendants would also have these notochords, and they would all be chordates. So everything that's descended from here would be in a group chordata, and we can put the label phylum on that. And then this group can evolve for all, this group, say they're evolving for all, and they acquire, say, warm-bloodedness and hair. So you have something here that's a mammal. Well, this set of species or taxa here, we could classify as mammals. And mammals end up being within chordates because the mammal has evolved from a chordate. And then you have splits within mammals that can give you the genus of Pan, which is where chimps and pygmy chimps are, and other genuses of mammals here. So the evolutionary process here provided an explanation for the nested set pattern that had been known about for a long time. And this was actually one of the first great kind of accomplishments of evolutionary biology and evolutionary thinking was that it provided the explanation for this thing that people knew to be true but didn't have a decent explanation for. So before we continue, I'd like to look at this cartoon from a science cartoon contest a few years ago. When we're thinking about family trees or phylogenetic trees or how things are related, on the left, this is a common misconception that you know we're showing ancestors to the present. That's not really a family tree, right? That's a particular lineage. That's not the tree. The tree is more like this, right? This branching diagram where we have maybe the thing we're interested in here. What's the closest thing on the branch? It's siblings, but of course, you're not kind of descended from your siblings. You're both descended from parents. And those parents are descended from grandparents who had other offspring that became cousins. So you're more closely related to your siblings. You and your siblings are more closely related to each other, because there's common ancestor, your parents. Then you are more closely related to your cousins, because you have the same grandparents, than any of you are to your second cousins. Because although they have the same great-grandparents, they don't have the same grandparents. So a phylogeny, this kind of diagram from the previous slide, is just depicting this tree here. And we want to make sure to keep in mind what's happening here. Right? These guys are not evolving from these guys. They are related to those guys, which you can see in this diagram. And so evolution of species is the same thing. right? We don't really think of 
fish evolving into salamanders, evolving into cats, evolving to us. Rather, it's best represented with a diagram like this, where we are more closely related to mammals because we have a common ancestor here that was a mammal. And then mammals are more closely related to amphibians because they have a common ancestor that's a four-legged vertebrate. Like you'd have to go back farther in time to find your great-grandparents than you would to find your grandparents. Same thing here, you go back farther in time to find the common ancestor of all vertebrates than to find the common ancestor of four-legged vertebrates. So you'll often see diagrams that look like this, kind of the progression of life, where sometimes they'll put a chimp at the beginning and a human at the end. Well, that's incorrect. Chimps are on a tree like this. They are not our ancestors. They're our relatives. So phylogenetics is the field of thinking about these diagrams to help us understand evolutionary history. So before we start thinking about phylogenetics, we need some terminology. So if we're going to have a diagram like this that's showing the relationship in the history of these different groups, what are the terms? So a taxon is a group, a species, something that you're putting on the end of the tree or the tips of our phylogenetic tree. Plural is taxa. So taxonomy is the name of the field which is thinking about how to classify species. And a phylogeny is a representation of how organisms are related. So this diagram here is a phylogeny. Phylogeny has some tips and it has some nodes. So this would be the phylogeny for taxa one, two, three. Note, it's not a phylogeny tree, right? Phylogeny is a noun, phylogenetic is an adjective. So this is a phylogeny or it is a phylogenetic tree. It's not a phylogeny tree. So we have these terms. And we have this diagram that's depicting the history of some groups, where again, you're going back in time. These are ancestors. Things are changing. Splits are occurring that are going to give us our modern taxa at the tips of this phylogeny. Now, these trees indicate relatedness due to common descent. So here are two examples here. I picked a kind of non-biological example here um, and a biological example here. And I like this example because we kind of can naturally understand some of the things about phylogenies that are common misconceptions or that there are common misconceptions about um, in a way that's a little bit more difficult when we're just thinking about animals. So when we have a phylogeny that's depicting a history of some groups showing common descent, there are some important things to keep in mind. First of all, the current taxa are not the same as the historical taxa, right? So you can see that here. If we think about Judaism today, that's very different than Judaism a couple thousand years ago. When you think about the Catholic Church today, that's very different than the Catholic Church 200 years ago. Same for Protestant, right? And if you go to this, whatever it is here, this religion here, that's not actually either Catholic or Protestant, right? In terms of the modern taxa, it's maybe something in between or something, right? The modern Catholic Church is different than it was a thousand years ago. Um, in the same way, in this diagram here, when we have humans here, if we go back in time, these things are not exactly the same as modern humans. If we go to chimp and pygmy chimp, this thing back here is not exactly like a modern chimp. This thing here is not exactly like a modern pygmy chimp. And this thing here, this ancestor of both chimps and pygmy chimps is neither one of them, right? It's probably maybe something sort of halfway in between, but it would not be accurate to think of it as being either chimp or pygmy chimp. You know, same thing here, right? It has descendants that are humans and descendants that are chimps, but it is not actually either one. So modern humans are different from what these things were a million years ago. And another common misconception is, from this diagram, we can see the modern Catholic Church is not descended from the Judaic Church, right? It's descended from whatever this thing was back there. The same way modern humans are not descended from either chimps or pygmy chimps, they're descended from whatever this thing was back there. So we always want to keep this straight that when we're looking at these phylogenies, the stuff that's in here is not the same as the stuff that's here. These are ancestors and these are descendants. And another thing that's helpful to see with this diagram is if we're looking for transitional forms, well, we expect to find them more in the past than in the present, right? What's the church that's halfway between Catholic and Protestant? Well, it's probably this thing that was back there. What's the organism that's kind of halfway between humans and chimps in terms of like some sort of transition? Well, it's gonna be back here. 
So we don't really expect to find intermediates and transitions um, between groups in the present because those transitions, those intermediate forms, are back in the past. About these trees, only the connectedness matters. You can rotate and it's arbitrary. So here, this diagram, we can kind of swivel the tree around this axis, right? Take these two and kind of flip their positions to get this. This tree represents the exact same history as this tree. The fact that these are closer together in this diagram and these are closer together in this diagram but the history is exactly the same, shows you that you can't judge proximity here. The only way to tell how things are related is to see how far back you have to go before they're connected. In this diagram, go back here, oh, and these two connect first, right? So they're more closely related. It doesn't matter which is on top, which is on bottom. So same thing in this tree. I've just um, done a couple of rotations, right? Gorilla, human, chimp, pygmy, chimp. If we flip here and then we flip there, you would get this tree. This tree is depicting the exact same evolutionary history as this tree, right? So even though in this one, gorillas are next to humans, that is not indicating close relationship, right? Because in fact, gorillas are more distantly related to humans than humans are to either of the chimps. So you always want to keep this in mind when you're looking at a phylogeny, whether the tacks are next to each other kind of vertically, that's not what's important. What's important is how are they connected when you go back into the tree, right? When you go back looking into the history and you find their common ancestor there, you go back in time to find the common ancestor there, these three are all more closely related, not because their text is next to each other, but because of what's being depicted in the diagram. If we have a tree with a set of taxa, we can know the relationships of subsets of those taxa just by removing the taxa we don't care about, right? And then retaining the pattern. So if we only cared about A, B, and C, we don't have to include D in our phylogeny. If we only care about A, C, and D, we don't have to include B. So we would then just show this reduced phylogeny here. And so you really want to be able to understand how this phylogeny can be turned into this one or this one just by kind of the emission of the taxa, right? So when we omitted B, we don't have to like have a kink in there or anything, right? C and D are shown related in the same way that they are there, right? The fact that we're omitting some taxa, we don't need to reflect that in our tree.